in verse 32. It says, and what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. You know, uh, uh, in verse 32, you have a little window. You know, this, this chapter sort of moves chronologically. You see verse 4, you have Abel. Verse 5, you have Enoch. Verse 7, you have Noah. And it's just sort of, he's sort of walking you through in order certain characters of the Bible. And you have Abraham and, and Isaac. And then you have Moses. And all of a sudden in verse 32, he lands you in one verse in the book of Judges. And he mentions um, some folks in this verse. And in this list in verse 32 is someone you almost never hear mentioned. And that is Barak. Barak. And so that takes us to Judges chapter 4. Would you turn with me to Judges chapter 4? Judges chapter 4. And the children of Israel did evil, again did evil, in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was Sisera, which dwelt in Herosheth of the Gentiles. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at that time. And she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah, between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim, and the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. And she sent and called Barak, the son of Ahinoam, Abinoam, out of Kedesh Naphtali, and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali and of the children of Zebulun? And I will draw unto thee to the river Kishon, Sisera, the captain of Jamin's army, with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. And Barak said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with thee, Notwithstanding, the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor. For the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kedesh. And Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kedesh. And he went up with 10,000 men at his feet. And Deborah went up with him. Now Heber the Kenite, which was of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, had severed himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent unto the plain of Zaanaim, which is by Kedesh. And they showed Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, was gone up to Mount Tabor. And Sisera gathered together all his chariots, even 900 chariots of iron. You know, you know what that's like, 900 chariots? We read that. You got to consider a couple things. The children of Israel had no weaponry, almost none, very little. You find that whenever 
the Philistines or whoever, you see this in the book of 1 Samuel, when the Philistines took over, they disarmed Israel. And that just made perfect sense. Uh, you find in one place it says the only guys that had swords in the whole camp of Israel was Saul and Jonathan. So, um, so you know, Israel, by and large, any weapons that they have are... Um, they're, they're homemade and handmade. Um, you know, it's like uh, in the 1600s. Uh, somebody mentioned this the other day. You know, I, I, I know some of the martial arts are, are rooted in Buddhism and all that stuff, you know. But they aren't all. Uh, one of the forms of karate that came out of Okinawa in the 1600s came about because the government disarmed the Japanese people. And so the people in Okinawa decided, well, we'll make do with what we have. Now, a lot of you guys know what nunchucks are, you know, and I'm illustrating a point here. You know, those two things with the rope in between, I think they're actually illegal. That's because they're so deadly. You know what those were? That was a rice harvesting tool. The government took their swords. The government took their spears. But they still had their tools. And there were several other weapons that came out of Okinawa during that period that are still used today in martial arts, and they were farming implements. Well, you know what's going on here? The, the Holy Spirit keeps bringing up they had 900 chariots of iron. They, Israel had no chariots. You know what it would be like? It'd be like, you know, Hananya decides to round us all up and take us to battle. And he rounds up all the churches in Alberta. And, you know, there's about 10,000 of us. And we say, where are we going? And then he says, we're going we're gonna to face the army. And, and, and we go out to the battlefield and there's 900 tanks sitting there. And we're like, thanks, Nanya. <laughs> and we're standing there with our rice harvesting tools. That's what's happening here in this passage. It's like 900 tanks. And all they've got is their farming tools. Any way you look at it, if Israel even has a chance, it's going to be a miracle of God Almighty. So let's keep reading. Verse 13. And Sisera gathered together all his chariots, even 900 chariots of iron, and all the people that were with him from Harasheth of the Gentiles and to the river of Kishon. And Deborah said unto Barak, Up! She's saying, Get with it, it's time. Up! For this is the day in which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thine hand. Is not the Lord gone out before thee? So Barak, at her cue, went down from Mount Tabor and 10,000 men after him. Again, 10,000, that's very few. Gideon thought he was doing good when he had 30,000, and God whittled him down to 300. Well, he, he doesn't have, he's got 10,000 men, and God only knows the host he's going against. Verse 15, and the Lord discomfited Syria. In other words, all of a sudden, the, the, in the enemy's army, for some strange supernatural reason, everything starts coming apart at the seams. And the Lord discomfited Syria and all his chariots and all his hosts with the edge of the sword before Barak, so that Sisera lighted down off his chariot and fled away on his feet. You know, as, as, as the children of Israel start, they start, something's happening. And, and man, it's, it's like Pharaoh's chariots. Pharaoh's chariots come into the Red Sea and God starts taking the wheels off the chariots. And man, everything's going bonkers. And, and you know, the army has swords, but they start probably turning against each other. They start running for their life. They're throwing down their weapons. Well, Israel says, a sword. And so th they start grabbing the enemy's swords. And the Lord discomfited Sisera and all his chariots and all his hosts with the edge of the sword before Barak, so that Sisera lighted down off his chariot and fled away on his feet. 
But Barak pursued after the chariots and after the host unto Herosheth. The Ch Ch chased him all the way back home to Herosheth of the Gentiles. And all the host, all the host, people, people haggle about all, the word all. And all the host of his Sisera fell upon the edge of the sword. And what did all mean? And there was not a man left. Howbeit, Sisera fled away on his feet to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber, the Kenite. And Jael, the wife, went out to meet Sisera and said unto him, Turn in, my lord, turn in to me. Fear not. I thought about that. Fear not. Don't be afraid. Come on in. And when he had turned in unto her into the tent, she covered him with a mantle. And he said unto her, verse 19, Give me, I pray thee, a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk and gave him drink and covered him. Again he said unto her, Stand in the door of the tent, and it shall be, when any man doth come and inquire of thee and say, Is there any man here that thou shalt say, No. Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent and took a hammer in her hand and went softly unto him and smote the nail into his temples. You know, you wouldn't get a second shot at that. Can you imagine how much force was behind that blow? And, you know, those nails, they, they, weren't, they weren't little little plywood nails. It was a tent peg. He's sleeping. Remember, they have oppressed Israel for 20 years. She doesn't know that God is in this, and this is going to turn out wonderful. She is, she is, she's probably going to die over this deal. But she doesn't care. She said, this has went on long enough. She sneaks up with that tent peg, and she hammered him. I mean, if the first tap didn't work, she was dead. She hit that sucker so hard in the temple. One blow was all it took. I mean, she went over the top. Look at verse 21. This, this is one of these women, men, you really wouldn't want to upset your wife too bad, I guess. <laughs> this woman had potential. <laughs> I, got a, I got a friend of mine. <laughs> Actually, it's, <laughs> it's Brother Ted Mullins. He's a missionary in New Guinea. He's been a missionary for years. When him and his wife got married, oh, I don't know if I should tell this or not. But he, they got married. They were lost. They were lost. They were young. And one day, he, he threatened her a little bit. They were lost. And she looked at him. And she said, if you ever lay a hand on me. She said, I'll wait till you're sleeping. And she said, I'll hit you with the cast iron so hard you won't wake up. <laughs> And apparently Ted thought she was serious because he never did it again. <laughs> That's this woman right here. You didn't mess with this one. Verse 21. Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent and took a hammer in her hand and went softly into him and smote the nail into his temples and fastened it into the ground. Man. Wow. Wow. For he was fast asleep. Where you know what? I, I figure I don't know that it went all the way through on the first swing, but she killed him on the first swing, and then she thought, "I'm just going to pin him to the ground." Wham! Wham! <laughs> verse twenty. The last three words of verse. So he died. <laughs> <laughs> I guess he did. I guess he did. And behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said unto him, Come 
And I will show thee the man whom thou seekest. She knew that battle was underway. She did know that. And when he came into her tent, behold, Sisera lay dead. Now you got to remember who Sisera was. He was the general of that opposing army. Sisera lay dead and the nail was in his temples. So God subdued on that day Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the children of Israel. And the hand of the children of Israel prospered and prevailed against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. You know, um, the hero of Judges 4, when you read this story, and I mean, I've preached this story before. Uh, we preached out of this passage on Mother's Day a few years ago. And we talked about what an amazing what an amazing story because, you know, you get into chapter 5 and Deborah says, you know, things were bad, she says, and the Holy Ghost inspired it, and it was true. She said things were bad until Deborah says, I arose a mother in Israel. I mean, we talked about Deborah, we talked about J.L., too. Two amazing women in this story. And um, when you hear Judges 4 preached, almost invariably, they're always talking about Deborah and J.L. In fact, you know, I'm sure somebody's preached on Barak, but I never heard it preached on. Barak just seems to be a necessary add-on to the story. He just seems, you know, he's a piece of the machinery, but... Um, when God recounts the heroes of faith, Deborah and Jael are not mentioned. That's interesting. Doesn't mean they weren't heroes. Doesn't mean their faith. Because there's a lot of people in Hebrews 11 that aren't mentioned. In Hebrews 11, he comes down, you know, to the end of that verse and he says, and Samuel and the prophets. So, you know, you got a whole string of prophets, but you know that. So he doesn't name everybody. But it is significant who he names. And he doesn't name Deborah or Jael. Now, he mentions a few women in Hebrews 11. By, he mentions Sarah. He mentions Moses' mom. He mentions Rahab. That was in the, Rahab was in the time of the judges. But he does not mention Deborah or Jael. Instead, it is Barak that is mentioned. So I want to talk to you tonight about the faith of Barak. In Hebrews 11, faith is defined and displayed. I mean, the whole chapter is just a display of what faith looks like. Faith has to do with things you hope for. It's something in your heart. And it's something you're hoping for. You're hoping God will do something. And, and faith shows the evidence of the things that you can't see. Because folks believed in Hebrews 11, they did something. In Hebrews 11, because they believed, they moved. They offered. They obeyed. They went out. They prepared. They sojourned, they looked, they blessed, they hid, they refused, they passed through, and on and on and on and on. And this is what faith did. What did Barak's faith cause him to do? In Romans 10, it says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It says, holy men of God. And in this passage, we have a prophetess. We have a woman of God. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And suddenly in Judges 4, verse 6 and 7, this holy woman of God is moved and she speaks. Look at Judges 4, verse 6. And she sent and called Barak, the son of Abinoam, out of Kedesh Naphtali and said unto him, here she goes. Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, go and draw toward Mount Tabor and take with thee 10,000 men of the children of Naphtali and of the children of Zebulun. And I will draw unto thee to the river Kishon, Sisera, 
the captain of Jabin's army, with his chariot and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. You know what he does? The first thing Barak does, and this is what's amazing, is um, he hears. And what he hears is outrageous. You know, we read these stories and we just get used to them. But God didn't speak to Barak. God spoke to Deborah. And Deborah says the word of the Lord to him. And she says, Barak, did you know what God is? God has just said that you're the man and you're going to do this. And, and, um, and it was, it was uh, pretty outrageous in view of a few things in view of their history. Look at verse three. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron. In 20 years, he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. And why was it? It was because of the evil that they had done. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she says, Did, didn't you hear God's voice, Beric? Hath not the Lord commanded it? And you're the one and you're going to do this. We've already commented on the military advantage of the, it was outrageous because of the military advantage of the enemy. It was outrageous because of the few that would go. You'll notice how the Lord describes the army of Sisera in verse seven. It says his chariots and his multitude. And what does what does Barak have? Oh, Deborah says, oh, you'll, you'll have 10,000 guys. Well, that's not real comforting. It was outrageous in view of the risk. What if, uh, what if, uh, what if Deborah was dreaming? What if Deborah hadn't really heard from the Lord? And he's supposed to he's supposed to go and round up 10,000 men and go tearing into a multitude of people just like he's got good sense. But faith hears the word of God. And faith says, boy, this is frightening. Faith says, you want me to do what? And faith says, Lord, is this you? And when faith is convinced it's the Lord. His faith moved him to lean. Look at verse 8. And Barak said unto her, unto Deborah, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. He believed that she was connected to God. He believed that what she had spoken had come from God. See, faith believes. And faith believed. And his faith moved him to lean. He didn't hear the voice of God. He didn't hear that voice. He didn't feel what she felt. But faith moved him to lean on that person connected to God. Faith caused him to not be concerned about who the hero was going to be. Look at verse 9. And she said, I will surely go with thee. But she said, I just want you to understand something. She said, even though I'm going, notwithstanding, the journey that thou takest shall not be for thy honor. She said, you're not going to get a medal out of this deal. You're not going to be the next one in the kingly line after this. Nobody's going to parade you through the streets and sing songs about you. For the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And boy, here we are 2,000 years later. And you know what we still do? We still talk about Deborah and J.L. 
Deborah said, I'll go with you. But she said, you just got to understand, you're not going to be the hero. Faith said, Faith said, Lord, I can do this. I'll, I'll do this for you. And I don't care whose praises they sing. Somebody said a long time ago, the Lord can do great things when a person, when he finds someone who doesn't care who gets the credit. Barrett didn't care. You don't find Barrett getting upset. You don't find Barrett confronting her. You don't find Barrett under a juniper tree. Barrett just says, well, praise the Lord. I'm glad I got to be a piece of the action. Now let's sing. Let's let's praise Deborah and JL. Deborah didn't wade into that valley. Deborah didn't take 10,000 men. Deborah didn't pick up a sword. JL didn't wade into the valley. Barrett did. But look who got the credit. Faith caused him to speak. It caused him to call Naphtali and Zebulun, verse 10. And Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kedesh. You know, uh, you know he, he, could, he could do whatever. But when he suddenly started calling Zebulun and Naphtali, um, he's calling them to battle. And uh, now he is committed. Now he's committed. You know, it's interesting. It shows up in the Psalms. And shows up in 2 Corinthians. It says, I believed and therefore have I spoken. Faith caused him to speak. Faith caused him to expose himself to the enemy's attention. Look at verse 12. And they showed Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, was gone up to Mount Tabor. He had scouts watching and they said, oh, looky there. We've got a rebel on our hands. He's got a, he's got a crowd of men with him. Faith caused him to go to the zone of battle. Faith caused him to go to a place that was intense. It, it caused him to go to a place of no return. You know what they call those places? They call them the theater of battle. And you know, a drama was about to play out. Faith caused him to go to the place where all the world would see and God was either going to come through or it was going to be terrible. That's what faith does. Sometimes faith brings you to a place. Now, you know, not everybody, not everybody listens and not everybody takes their steps and not everybody leans on that person that's connected to God. And not everybody does those things. But the person that is following the Lord, boy, we saw oh, several songs tonight. You know, him, you had no idea what I was going to preach on the night. But several of those songs tonight about battle. And and um, you know what faith will do? No, I, I don't I don't realize. I realize you can flip this around, and there's always people that that want to do something crazy for attention and want to risk everything and to look like a champ. But again, um, Barak already knew he, he wasn't going to get any glory out of this whatsoever. God was going to come through or it was going to be terrible. Look at verse 13 and 14. And Sisera gathered together all his chariots, even 900 chariots of iron and all the people that were with him from Erosius of the Gentiles and to the river of Kishon. And Deborah said unto Barak, Up, for this is the day 
in which the Lord hath delivered into thine hand is, now watch, is not the Lord gone out before thee? Uh, you know, Deborah, Deborah was feeling something and seeing something, but Barak was not seeing it. You know, faith moved him to, to right then trust that the God that he could not see was actually doing something. You know, Elisha and his servant there in 2 Kings, you know, the servant comes out one day and, and um, the city is surrounded by the, the enemy's army and the enemy has come to get Elisha. And the servant comes in and he says, alas, master, what shall we do? He said, the, the city is compassed with the chariots of the enemy. And Elisha prays and he says, Lord, Open his eyes. And it says, And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Elisha could see it, but the servant could not. But it was still very real, still very true. Uh, Elisha was not worried. He knew that in the invisible world, um, God was right there, right then. And um, faith moved Barak to believe that though he could not see it, that God was moving right then. Look at verse 16. But Barak pursued after the chariots and after the host. Man, he starts winning this battle in verse 15. The Lord, the Lord steps in and, and he's at work and, and, um, and God gives Barak the upper hand and they start to win against this massive multitude, which the Lord had promised the children of Israel long before that, you know, you know, five of you will chase a thousand. And they were seeing it. But he's, he's not just content to uh, win that battle and just, you know, oh, okay, they're running. We've killed a bunch of them. You know, we're, we're, we're on top now. We're good to go. No, uh, faith caused him to pursue. Faith caused him to pursue to the last man. I mean, Barak believes that God has spoken to him. Barak was not given a number. Barak just believed, I'm supposed to finish this job. And he is going to pursue it as far as God will let him pursue it. And God says, We'll just go right to the last man on this one. He leaves nothing undone. He will not stop short. You know, this year and already this year, God has spoken to some of you about some things that he wants you to do this year. Some things that need to be done different. Maybe he spoke to you this morning about a decision you need to make. And you know what your temptation is going to be? It's going to be sort of half do it and get halfway through it. You get half the blessing and you feel good. It's going wonderful. And you know, it just sort of fades out. Will you pursue? Faith says, I'm going to see this thing through to the end. Man, we're off to a good start. Let's just keep it going. Faith pursues. JL wasn't pursuing anything. Well, J.L. was a hero. Don't understand. I'm not, mis I'm not minimized. But I'm just saying, why did God put Barak in Hebrews 11? Deborah wasn't chasing anybody down with the sword that we know of. I mean, she, she was there with Barak somewhere nearby, and she was hanging around. But, but I, you don't read she picked up a sword. I think if she had, God would have mentioned it because he tells us about, he tells us about J.L. If Deborah had picked up a sword, he'd have told us. You know what Barak does? He is not going to stop short. He's going to finish this off to the last man. And you know where he winds up? He winds up at the place of the last man. Look at verse 22. And behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him. 
Merrick's going, I think we've got everybody else. Has anybody seen Sisera? All right, guys, we got to find him. And she says, come, and I will show thee the man whom thou seekest. And he's laying dead. And Merrick goes, there he is, the last man. Look at verse 23. So God subdued on that day Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the children of Israel. You know what faith caused Barak to do? Faith would let God do a great work through him. And then, then you come to chapter 5. In chapter 5, verse 1, there, there's two chapters like this. There, there may be a third. But you have in, in Exodus, um, Exodus 15, at the end of chapter 14, Pharaoh and all his army, and again, there was not a man left. And Exodus 15 opens up with the children of Israel on the banks of the Red Sea, and they start to sing. Well, here you see them, and this time they have wiped out to the last man the army. Of Jabin. And the chapter opens up and they sing. Now, you know what we call this chapter? We call this chapter, you you may have a title in your Bible, and, and my, my Bible titles it correctly, but, but I never see it says the song of Deborah and Barak, but that's never what I see. Anybody that talks about this chapter, they call this the song of Deborah. That's what they call it. But look what God calls it in verse 1. Then sang Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, on that day. Verse 12, it says, Awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake, utter a song. Arise, Barak. And lead thy captivity captive, thou son of Abinoam. And of course, we know what Jesus did. He led captivity captive. So you see Barak, you know, he's he's like his master. And, uh, and in verse 15, it says, And the princes of Issachar were with Deborah, even Issachar, and also Barak. He was sent on foot into the valley. Again, you see him, he's going against chariots. And he's on foot. Verse 19 of chapter 5. The kings came and fought. Then fought the kings of Canaan and Taanach by the waters of Megiddo. They took no gain of money. They fought, but in this verse, it's not the kings of Canaan. They fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. The river of Kishon swept them away. That ancient river the river Kishon. Oh, my soul, thou hast trodden down strength. You know what? You know what Barak's faith did? It opened a door and it even caused the forces of nature to join in the battle. I, you see that more than one place. You see, Daniel gets thrown in the lion's den, and uh, boy, the forces of nature in that place are stopped. That's what faith does. So if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. The Lord said in another place, is there anything too hard for me? We opened up with Hebrews 11. And in verse 33 or 34, I can't remember which one it was. It says, by faith they, and here's what you see in this, in this Judges 4 and 5. By faith, by faith, they, these men. It, it doesn't say the whole army had faith. No, it says Barak had faith. Joshua had faith. Moses had faith. One man had faith. And what did he do? David. They subdued kingdoms. So if their faith can subdue a kingdom, 
how much more could our faith subdue some aggravations? How much more could our faith subdue some of our bad habits and subdue our past and subdue our baggage and subdue our body and subdue our pessimistic outlook and subdue evil spirits and subdue walls. Some of you, you know, no doubt you, you see walls in front of you and some of those walls may really be legit. They may be hard and fast and big and they may have been built years ago and you've tried to storm that wall and you've never gotten over it. But David said, by my God, I have leaped over a wall. Leaped! Uh, by the way, David's there. How did he do it? By faith. He just, he just, he believed. He leaned. He moved. Help me out. What's, what's the name of that missionary that went into East Germany? Rick Weimer. Rick Weimer, quite a number of years ago, um, when the wall was still up between East and West Germany, um, Rick Weimer was a young guy and he felt God had called him to East Germany. But East Germany, that's like saying, sort of like saying you're called to North Korea. It's like, you know, can you imagine uh, raising support, you know, and, and he was trying to raise support, but hardly anybody would support him because they said, you know, well, if you're going to go to Germany, go to West Germany. He said, no, he said, he said, I, I don't mind going to West Germany, but he said, but he said, uh, he said, I may have to start there, but he said, but God has called me to East Germany. And, and, you know, we know the story. We know the wall came down and all that stuff, but you got to remember, you know, you know, however many years ago that was, uh, nobody had any inkling what was coming. You don't either. You don't know what's going to happen next year. And, you know, we see these problems. We see these hurdles. We see what's going to happen, you know, and, and we just we just see these walls and we think, wow, they're pretty big. And and, you know, they're it's it's a government that's behind it. And 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 how was one puny, young, spindly, single, single missionary? And th maybe that was to his advantage, you know, because he wasn't going to take wife and kids. Or, how was he going to get into East Germany? He said, I'm called East Germany. Well, his pastor believed him, but nobody else believed him. And um, so uh, Rick Weimer, he went to Germany. So he got there and he was there a little while and he wasn't there long. And he said, well, Lord, he said, you've called me to East Germany. He said, Lord, how do I how do I get across this wall? And, uh, you know, it's amazing, the simplicity that's in Christ. It's amazing how if any of you lack wisdom, it's amazing the power of God. You know what got him across the wall? A bundle of bananas. A bundle of bananas. It didn't take a pole vault because they would have shot him dead. You know, if he'd have tried to climb over, they would have shot him dead. If he'd if he'd have tried to ram the barrier, they'd killed him. But he showed up with a big bundle of bananas one day. And he, he comes up to the border guards and he said, uh, he said, I, I want to go into East Germany. And the border guard said, uh, for what? And he said, I want to preach on the street over there. And they said, you want to do what? He said, I want to preach on the street. And they said, no. And he said, I got a big bundle of bananas I'll give you. You got to remember in those communist countries, you know, it's not like it is here where food is plentiful. And, and he pulls this big bundle of bananas out of, the, out of the back of his vehicle. And the border guard goes, I'll give you three hours. He said, okay, gave him the bananas. He said, and the border guard said, don't be late. He goes in and he's preaching on the street in a place where it was against the law for many years and nobody said it could be done. And a bundle of bananas got him leaped over the wall. Next week, he showed up with another bundle of bananas. And he says, I want to go across and preach. And the border guard says, no. And he said, I got another bundle of bananas. And the guard said, I'll give you three hours. Don't be late. This started happening week after week 
after week. One day, Rick Weimer's over there and he sees this house on the communist side. And you got to remember, you know, over there, you know, people, they don't they don't have money. And it's the, the economy in those communist places is usually pretty lousy. And he said, here was this house, nice size house, decent house. And um, it was like, I, I think it was like $3,000. And he calls his pastor. He said, pastor. He said, there's a house over here in East Germany. He just for sale for $3,000. And the pastor said, I'll send you the money, buy it. So now all of a sudden, not only is he preaching in East Germany every week, now he's got a house over there. And the rest is history. Wasn't long. The wall came down and suddenly property values went through the roof. He had a $30,000, $40,000 house that he bought for $3,000. He had a house. He got married in there somewhere. He was good to go. Do you know why? Through faith. God said, that voice said, East Germany. And he said, Lord, nobody goes there. Nobody. And the Lord said, yeah, but that's no problem for me. I want you to cross the wall. And he said, Lord, I don't know how, but I'll do it. Who through faith, through faith, through faith, they subdued a kingdom. A kingdom. If they can subdue a kingdom through their faith. I think we can subdue the problems that are looming in front of us. I think through faith, we can subdue the excuses and the things that have been pesterness and the, all the, all the things that are robbing our joy or whatever through faith. He said, time would fail to tell of Gideon and of, Barrett. Is there anything? You know, God, God's not, some of us in this room, God's not asking you to go up against a bunch of tanks. You know, he, he just like, he, he'd like for you to give him the privilege of changing your mindset. He'd like for you to give him a shot at changing that bad habit. He'd like for you to give him a shot at overcoming your past. He says, if I can, if I can, if I can subdue a kingdom, he said, this year I can help you. He can help you. How will he do it? Through faith. Through faith. Let's pray. Lord, we pray you'd help us all this year. Lord, we've all got ground that we need to take. And some of us, Lord, we got ground we need to retake. Lord, we love you and we love your book. And uh, Lord, no doubt there are spirits, Lord, that are posted at our doors. And Lord, they oppose us and they haunt us. And Lord, we've got bad habits. And we've got all sorts of things. But Lord, through simple faith, Barak subdued a kingdom. Lord, would you help us? Lord, we sang that song a while ago, and it says, ask the Savior to help you. Comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you through. Lord, would you help us? Lord, it, it, we know you will, but Lord, would you help us? Would you help us to be serious about wanting your help? Lord, may this be a year of real victory. And Lord, even in this room tonight, Lord, 
maybe maybe there's things that are coming to people's minds lord would you help help us all to know that you are more than up to the challenge lord in jesus name with your heads bowed and your eyes closed if god has spoken to you tonight why don't you talk to him The song she's played is called Jesus Never Fails. He will not fail thee. Would you believe him? Jesus never fails. Thank you for this story. God bless it to our hearts. Help us, Lord, to realize, Lord, with you, all things are possible. Lord, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Lord, make that a reality in our hearts and our thoughts. God, may it not leave us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.